Okay, it's four o'clock, so we'll get started here very, very momentarily. Um, I'm going to mute everybody. Thanks for thanks for coming to our uh, fourth edition of our webinar series. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and we'll get started. Um, the inspiration for this edition of the webinar series came from a, a remark that Kevin McDermott made during his webinar, uh, positing that the most common reason that people do a drill is uh, either, well, the coach told me to do that drill, or, well, we always do that drill. And Kevin said, it's, uh, it's not such a good, it's, it's a, it's, it, it would be a good thing, excuse me, getting tongue tied and getting ahead of myself. It would be a good thing if before you do a drill, you have a clear idea in your mind of what the drill is intended to accomplish for you. And so I wanted to start with this quotation, that which we attend to improves and that which we perform mindlessly merely repeats. And of course, if you wanna improve your sculling, you, uh, you wanna avoid performing your sculling mindlessly. Um, so from that, it follows that the reason to do a drill ought to be because you have something specific in mind about your sculling stroke that you would like to improve or that you would like to refine. And so when you undertake to do, to do a drill, have a clear idea of what the drill is for. Um, for example, the traditional use of the pick drill. Everybody does the pick drill. And the most traditional use of it is to emphasize the sequence of events in, and the order in which they ought to happen on the recovery. And uh, similarly, there's a, there's a drill that has about a baker's half dozen names. Uh, a lot of coaches call it, I, first, I was first introduced to it as the reverse pick drill. And the idea is to start with about the first 25% of the drive and make it a, a legs and hips only sort of thing and then go to uh, half the drive and three quarters of the drive. And uh, some coaches call it the reverse pick drill. I've heard it called Stuff the Duck by an Australian elite rower. Um, a lot of programs call it top quarter, top half, three quarters, and so on and so forth. And the most traditional use of that drill uh, tends to be to, to get the sculler or the rowers um, to, to initiate the drive with their hips, not to open their backs too early. Uh, a lot of coaches use that drill for teaching suspension. Um, and one of, the, one, of, one of the ways that I like to use that drill is to, is to teach rowers and scullers that the release can happen anywhere during the drive that you choose to put it. And what you're trying to do with that drill is find your optimal spot for release of the blade. Um, so with, with all of that in mind, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists and they're going to take you through each of their favorite drills. And uh, at the conclusion of those four presentations, uh, Erica will be taking questions over the course of the, uh, of the um, webinar. Message her in the chat and Erica will organize and, uh, and ask us the questions at the, at the end of the presentation. So again, thanks everyone for being here. And I'm gonna turn this over to Ellen, who is going to present some video and her uh, reasons for doing the drill that is her favorite. Ellen, it's all you, go ahead and share your screen. Okay. My favorite drill is the rowing in place drill. And anybody who's hung around with me um, has, done it, seen me do it. And as Troy said, a drill is only useful if it can be applied to a real rowing situation. So this is a photo of me um, rowing in place, not deliberately, but um, stuck in a tide rip. Um, and I needed to be able to get out of it. So here's the drill.
so I'll let it play again while I talk in a second. So the first thing it can help you with is balance and you relax, you float through the stroke, you see how you fit in the system, you find your natural range of motion, you can feel the horizontal <clears throat> nature of the stroke and you can let the crossover happen. So. Um, so what to feel? How do I fit in the boat? Your upper body stays really loose. You follow the path of the handles and that tells you the handle height and the blade depth. So we'll go to the, we'll watch this again. Troy pointed out that I was doing this with a little bit of intensity. You can do it with absolutely no intensity if you wish, but you can see the blades stay at a nice depth. I just float through, follow what happens. So for how it affects the drive, the blades are already buried in the water. You start the drive that way, and that's the way you should start the drive. So you can begin to feel the smoothness of that initial push slowly and smoothly. You can feel the connection and the hang because you're not missing water. The body's moving as a unit and the legs start and then the body swing comes into it. At the release, the handles can float all the way into your body. You don't need to yank them in there. You can see how the elbows stay level with the wrist. And you can also see how the blades begin to come out of the water. So here's, uh, whoop, uh, how do I get back? There we go. You can also see there's a little wobble going on here. Um, if I were being really, really light, then I wouldn't be imposing myself on the system so much and I wouldn't have that wobble. But watch how the blades start to come out of the water all by themselves. I didn't do that. It just happened. And um, other observations, and we can see that in the next video, my arms continue to open after my body is set. And there's just a natural flow of where I come into the stroke. Backing into the catch is exactly how you back. So when you do this exercise, your body can start to feel how you want to be using the oars how horizontal they are, how gentle they are when you go into the stroke. If you try it with your eyes closed, which is what I often have beginners do, you take away everything that's distracting you and you just let yourself be in the boat. And you can try it with different intensities. If you do it very, very gently with somebody holding your stern, they could hardly feel any movement at all. If somebody does it really um, with a lot of power, then they might pull you into the water. Um, and holding onto a boat while somebody's doing this rowing in place exercise lets you as a, as a coach or as a friend feel how they're using their power in the stroke. Then here's another um, version. And in this video, I tried to have really loose hands and just watch what happens once I come into full compression. I think that, whoops, my arms just keep going. Uh, okay. We're on. And this video, this exercise is useful for so many different things that 
we're you can, on. You can choose something in your stroke that you want to pay attention to, the horizontal, the crossover, watch the crossover. Um, you can also see that my left hand is always down a little bit on the oar handle. That's been happening since I began to row. I think about it, but uh, it pops itself back into um, my sculling all the time, just all by itself. These videos were taken from the shore. They're two strokes, and that's another thing that can be helpful for you if you have a friend who can take the shot and you can focus on one particular aspect of the stroke or all of it. So here's the beginning. Why do I do this? What's it do for me in real life? Um, it helps my presence in the boat and it helps me trust the system. Even in rough water like this, the boat knows what to do and I try to let it and then put myself into it where it matters. It's also a very fun drill to do. Um, I row lots of different boats and it's very useful to find out how high the boat is rigged, what's the inboard going to do, how do my hands have to behave at the crossover, what's the natural position that makes sense in the boat. So that's a summary of that drill. And I guess questions will come at the end, Troy? Yep. Um, yeah, the, uh, the rowing in place drill, it's, it's become a favorite up here at Craftsbury. And, uh, for the most part, Ellen introduced us to that and, uh, got us to, um, make it a part of the core curriculum. So let's go to Jeannie then. I'm going to share my screen for Jeannie. So one moment. Well, Erica, we might need to go back and forth because I lost my ability to see my slides now for some reason. Okay, but anyway, just let me know when you want me to navigate. Okay, yep. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the pause drills, and I sort of think of the pause drills as the chicken soup of drills because they can be good for anything. Any, any problem you have, if you make yourself stop at some point, it gives you a chance to focus. And so it fits in perfectly with what Troy was saying, is that we have to attend to something. And if we're simply rowing and rowing and rowing, we don't necessarily take the time to do that. So I'm going to present two different places, uh, two different pause drills that I personally like to use. And I'll tell you a little bit about why. OK, Erica, next screen. Next slide, I mean. Um, so I use the pause drill to nail into my head and my body and my motion to get to my proper body, body preparation. Body preparation, and we'll sh show you a picture of that soon, is the motion of the hands coming around the release and the body rocking over to the point that I have put my shoulders to the stern of my hips. And this helps to establish a safe spinal alignment that will help decrease the chance of back injury. It also helps reduce extraneous movement at the entry so that by the time you start letting the boat move under you and your knees bend, you have set that body alignment and there's nothing else to do up at that entry except maybe let your arms come apart a little bit more, but there's no down or upward motion to add extraneous motion. It will help increase the efficiency of your power application because it puts you into hip flexion. And if we're flexing at the hips, it means that we can then use the really large muscles, the glutes and the hamstrings, to open those hips to go into hip extension at the point where we want it to. If you have great body preparation and you come up to the entry or the entry comes to you, and you've given away some of that body flexion, you have less ability to open the hips, to extend the hips, and so you're losing the ability to use those large, large, large posterior chain muscles. Okay, Erica, next. So what are the hallmarks of good body prep? And we'll look at a picture of this in a second. 
The back is in a natural, unrounded position. It's loose yet firm. We're not talking about a military position that's very rigid. The shoulders are down. You can see the person's neck. The shoulders are to the stern of the hips. And I have to say that everybody's different. So the picture we're gonna look at, to me, is a really great classic body prep. But these are young athletes, and we are all have different limitations. We have different body types, different body uh, abilities of flexion, different upper body compared to lower body. So you might not reach, you might not achieve this classic body prep position. But basically you have to do the best you can do. Do you have a hamstring flexibility issue? Can you sit on a butt pad? If you have very high waist and short torso, it might help you to lower your foot stretchers or sit on a butt pad. And you also wanna be sure that you're sitting more on the front of the seat instead of the back part of the seat. And so in my mind, the goal is not necessarily to put your chest to your knees, and some people can do that. But the, you wanna keep your chest up, but tilted forward. And if you had something written on the front of your shirt, somebody should be able to see it so that we're not scrunched over or so tight that we um, are smushed together. So we can look at this next picture and get an idea of what, what all these points are that I'm talking about. Erica, next. Thank you. So these rowers have obviously rowed a little bit. They're already in and they've already started their drive. But if you think that they've come compressed just a little bit more, you can see this wonderful stripe on the stroke seat. And you can see how far forward his shoulders are to the stern compared to his hips. And Eric is doing a nice job, thank you, of pointing that out. His back is not rigid, but there's no curve in the upper cervical area, which is often where there is curving because people try to get more reach, even though what we really want to do is spread apart up there. And by reaching, they round out the upper back. And that's really bad for just the, your vertebrae. We can see a lot of neck. The shoulders are down and relaxed, and there's no trap action, uh, which would eliminate the ability of the lats to contribute to the hanging position of this rower. Eyes are up. You can see at the, on the bow person, you can actually see an S or something on his uniform. So his chest is up. If I was at the front end, I'd be able to read whatever that is on his chest. Eyes up, arms long, back nice and naturally stacked. I won't say straight because we're not necessarily looking for straight. The back has natural curves. We don't want to accentuate them or put curves where curves aren't supposed to be. Again, the shoulders are nicely down and relaxed. Okay, Erica, so that's good, thank you. Next slide. So the first drill is pausing with the hands away and the body over. So you've come around the finish or the release. I wanna say you've come around the release and you've rocked the body forward. And we're gonna do this rowing at half slide. And the reason I like doing it at half slide is that it allows the boat to remain stable while you work on this one thing. We're not trying to go all the way to the entry and get into the tippy position. We're just letting ourselves come a little way up the slide because what we're really working on is have I achieved all the body angle forward that I'm gonna get? And I should almost get that all by half slide. So I'm just gonna do this drill at half slide. So I'm going to start in my hands away body over position where I've gotten my body angle, my shoulders are in front of my hips. I'm going to come about halfway up to the entry. I'm going to let the boat come under me about halfway to the entry. I'm going to take one stroke and pause. And the pause is really important to attend to what you're supposed to be thinking about. It's not, oh, let me get going with this drill because I want to get to my workout. So while you're sitting there, in that pause position, you're thinking, is my back rounded? Have I swung as far forward as I can? Are my shoulders in front of my hips? Are my eyes up? Are my shoulders down? You should have almost a little checklist that you want to go through before you go to the next stage of this drill. And the next stage of this drill would be to take two strokes at half slide and then pause. And then you take three strokes at half slide and you pause. And you eventually get up to 10. So I like to say we do onesies, twosies, threesies, foursies, and mostly the women who've played jacks at some point in their life, 
know what I'm talking about when I say that. So it's one stroke pause, evaluate. Two strokes pause, evaluate. Three strokes pause, evaluate. So I have a little clip of me doing the drill that we'll show here. So there's my pause position. I'm going to half slide. I take one stroke. I finish around. My hands come away. I rock over and I glide. And I just sit there and I evaluate. I could probably even sit longer than that. So now there's two strokes. And I finish around. I release, come around. And I sit there and I pause. I think. And then I go to three. And then I row into the fog and we stopped filming. So Eric, if you want to go back to the, the description of the drill, I'll just review it. So you start in the pause position, the hands away and the body over, go about half slide, take one stroke, pause, sit and evaluate. Don't rush to the next stroke. Then take two, pause, three, pause. Okay, all right. There's a second drill that sort of builds on this. Eric, you want to move through that? Yep, yeah, thank you. And this is now we're going to alternate between half slide rowing and full slide rowing. So it's very similar to the other one. We're going to take one, we're going to start in the pause position, take one stroke at half slide, and then one complete stroke and then pause. Right, so when we're drawing the shorter stroke, we're thinking about getting almost all that body preparation before I get to half slide. When I then take my full slide stroke, I'm really focusing on not changing as I approach the entry, not trying for more and collapsing and not letting my hips come under me and ending up sitting upright instead of tilted. So it's one half, one full pause, two half, two full pause, and again, up to 10. So Eric, if you want to show that. So this will be a half slide stroke and then a full slide stroke. And now I'm gonna pause and I evaluate my body position. Now I take two where I'm focusing on getting all of that preparation by the time I get to half slide and then two full where I'm focusing on not changing as I approach the entry. Okay. I think that's all I'm going to say. Jeannie, there was a request in the chat for, yep. I, I believe, for you to walk through the first video again. Could I go back okay. to that? Okay. So this is just rowing with only half slide. So there's my, there's my body prep. I come to half slide. I take one stroke and I sit and I evaluate. Did I get all the forward reach I can? Now I take two strokes. I should have my forward angle by the time I get to half slide. And that's what I'm focusing on here. Is my position good? And do I have everything I want by the time I get to half slide? I hope that clears things up. Okay, okay. looks good. good. Yep. All right, so I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Carol, are you ready to present next? I'm going to talk about the wide grip drill. This is a little more advanced drill. You want to be definitely comfortable in your racing single or you're in a boat. You know, maybe it's a little bit wider and you're definitely comfortable in it. Um, you're able to do the drill that um, Ellen and Jeannie just talked about. And one thing I noticed uh, just watching Ellen and Jeannie was how relaxed uh, and open their chest was. The shoulders were back as they were as their hands were crossing over each other on the approach to the catch. Um, I can't pull it up now because I'm afraid I'm going to lose John Graves here. But on the ad for this webinar, there was a young man um, sculling along. He looked like he was really fit. In fact, overall, he was he had good body prep and everything else. But his, at the crossover, his shoulders were just really tight and together. And I find that it's, this was my big problem for a long time. I don't know if sweep rowing had anything to do with it do with it before I started sculling. But once you get to this position at the crossover, it's really hard to undo it and get your hands to open out again. So this is why I like the wide grip drill because it gets you opened up and sculling with a wide grip. Um, 
and teaches you how to be open and wide even as your hands come over closer together. So before I get to that, I have my oar here with me. I'll try not to take out a lamp or my cat or anything like that. I just want to show you the grips that I'm talking about here. So this is your normal grip on the end of the handle. And then this is what I would call wide grip. You go to where the handle inserts into the shaft, about two inches down, that would be wide grip. So each hand would be rowing in that position. And then there's also the medium wide grip, and that's the grip that John Graves will be doing, where you, you hold your index finger close to the notch of the handle, or you can even overlap the notch a little bit. So let's go to screen share. And there he is. All right, can everybody see it? Erica, can you let me know that this can be seen? Yes, I can see it, Carol. Okay, good. That means everybody else can too. All right, so this is John Graves. He's a very accomplished sculler, and um, he's doing the wide grip drill. Keep in mind that this is a drill, once again, um, you want to be warmed up pretty well before you start it. You want to be comfortable in your boat. You made that transition from walking around on land to being in the boat. Also, you want your body to be warmed up because you're actually going to be putting quite a load um, on, your, on your body because you don't have nearly the same leverage that you would in normal grip. I'm just going to play this for a little bit so you can watch it. So he's also going feet out, and you'll notice that he also has a bungee cord. So he's doing all kinds of things here. You notice how wide his chest is, open. Again, like Ellen and Edie were talking about, very horizontal. Still keeping the handles going, even though he's not holding on to the handles. He's putting them right where he wants them. And then he flips back to normal grip. And I'll start this again. The one thing that's nice is at this point, he's got his shoulders are down and relaxed. Everything that um, the other two presenters just talked about, he's doing that. Um, nice broad shoulders and notice his looseness in your, his arms. If you compare that to the young man um, who's on the ad for this webinar, you'll notice that his arms are very tight and his shoulders are collapsed together. So this helps him keep a nice wide opening. And again, he's just doing the medium grip. If he was doing wide grip, like even wider grip, he'd probably be covering up that green piece of tape there. So if we go through this, see how everything just stays nicely open. Now, one thing you have to be careful about doing this drill when you go to wide grip is that it's really easy to push the handles out farther than you normally would. And you might run the risk of getting the shaft too parallel to the boat and really create some imbalance. Be able to place the blades. Now right here the arms get straighter, more extended, but that's on the approach to the catch. And then it's very important that with this load you're very patient through the drive. It's very easy to try to overpower the boat. So you just have to make sure you're very patient. And then the elbows are out wide, chest is wide. Nice release. Coming back out again. Just tell relative to the red stripe on his shirt how nice and horizontal everything is. Very minimal up and down. I'll start this up again. So if you're doing this drill for the first time, um, and I'm so glad I'm going third now because um, a good way to start, if you've never done this drill, is start with holding the handles with a wide grip, but doing the, maybe not rolling in place, but uh, just having the blades flat on the water and going back and forth in place like Ellen was. And this just helps you get used to that wide arc of the hands before you get started. And then once you get comfortable with that, you feel like you're going nice and horizontal, then you could start rowing wide grip, but start out rowing a little bit shorter. Wait until you're comfortable, say, rowing quarter slide and then half slide uh, with this. And once again, try not to overpower the stroke. Um, and then when you're ready, just start feeling like you can get longer and longer. And once again, be careful not to push the handles out too far at the catch because it's a little easier to get beyond the catch position with the wide grip. 
So you do the wide grip for a little while, stop. If it gets wobbly at any time, just stop, take a breath, relax your hands and start up again. This is the kind of drill, and I think it's true for the other drills as well. They're hard to do at first, but the better you get at the drill, the better, the, the more the drill can help you pay attention to what you want to be thinking about with the rowing. It will be a little frustrating at first, uh, but again, if you get frustrated, just stop, relax, and start over again. You will get better at it. Um, I wouldn't recommend this particular drill for conditions that Ellen had. Um, that might be, a, it's doable, and I'm sure Ellen's gonna go out like tomorrow and give it a shot, uh, knowing Ellen, but uh, you want pretty nice water for this, especially if you're just starting out. So you do, Wide grip for a little bit, stop, take it easy, move your hands into this medium grip that John has here. And as you, this is the most important thing for this drill, as you move your hands closer to normal grip, try to keep your chest open and um, pinch, pinching the shoulders together. We all know we don't wanna hunch our shoulders and hide our ears that um, Jeannie was talking about in her slides. But the other thing is you wanna keep the shoulders down and also keep them back as you're coming through the crossover. And one thing that John does pretty well here, play through. Is right as the handle to crossing over, notice how the elbows are just a little bit bent. This keeps, this allows the arms and the shoulders to stay nice and relaxed. And then as he comes past that position and the handles start to separate, now he can straighten his arms out. So he kind of straightens his arms out to the side rather than you know, right from the beginning reaching forward. Now the goal, the useful thing here is that the more you can keep your chest open and relax, the more that allows you to get a wider spread of the handles at the catch, which means you get more of a catch angle. And length and sculling isn't about reach out towards the stern, it's about how far you can spread the handles apart. All right, then um, when you've done your rowing uh, by wide grip and then taking some time to row by um, the medium grip, then you can go to the normal grip, really paying attention to keeping your shoulders nice and wide. And the key to that is just letting the elbows be bent and relaxed as the handles cross over. Another good drill after you get good at that is you incorporate, um, go 20 strokes wide grip, 20 strokes normal grip, and then 20 strokes, uh, excuse me, 20 strokes wide, 20 strokes medium, 20 strokes normal without stopping the stroke. You just go continuous and this will put it on a little bit of comfort in the boat drill um, along with uh, this drill and it just allows you to be looser in the hands be a little more comfortable so if you watch john towards the end of this clip well, i have to go back just a little bit so let me just take it back a little bit here he's going to go rowing wide grip so rowing with normal grip and a good time there he is right there he just hopped over Kept his body the same, but just adjusted his grip. So I'll show that to you again. This guy's a very proficient rower. You know, you probably see him in the you won't see him in the Olympics next summer, unfortunately, not this summer. The wide grip, and then just what the heck? Let go of the wide grip, jump onto the normal grip. Now um, what I talked, what was important to me in this discussion was this thing to be attentive to in this particular case, it was maintaining the open body, shoulders back and relaxed as well as down and relaxed while the hands cross over, which will allow you to have a wider spread at the catch. This drill is also good for feeling the connection to the water and the timing of the power application. If you do the wide grip at let's say quarter to half slide, it almost feels like a horizontal deadlift, which is a really good exercise for engaging the hips um, to the blades and just really feel the hips determining the speed of the drive rather than sort of a randomness of just the body opening. So it help, allows you to feel the connection all the way through. Okay, that's pretty much all I have with that. 
try to get out of this. Yep. Carol, somebody did ask in the chat quickly if you could go over the purpose of the wide grip drill again, just the reason for it. Um, the reason for it is to, um, if you have a tendency to row with tight shoulders, that at the crossover your arms are stiff and tight and attempt to pull your shoulders together, and then you find that you really can't get your handles far apart at the catch. This helps you realize what it's like, if you row wide grip, what it's like to row with the body open. You know, so Because it spreads your hands apart, spreads your elbows apart, really allows the chest to stay open, and then you bring the hands back and try to keep your chest open in that way. So that's the purpose of the drill. Does that help? All right, so let me find my Zoom again here. And I will get out of screen share. Let's see. I think I'm out, or you guys can take me out. Yep, you're good. Thanks, Carol. Uh, let's go to Helen. Suspension series. All right, so suspension is uh, kind of my all time favorite topic to cover. And any athletes who have trained with me will probably tell you that they're pretty tired of doing it. <laughs> But, um, so I'm, I'm gonna start off just kind of giving a little bit of context around how I approach drill work. And one, I heard a phrase recently in a webinar that was um, drills don't equal skills. And that really clicked with me and I actually went through and changed the wording on these slides to use the word skill more often than drill. And I think that that's a, that's a nice way of in very few syllables summing up the idea that you have to go out and do these drills with intention and then apply them with intention to the actual activity that you're trying to get better at and it's that intentional application in the specific activity that results in skill so what i look at drills allowing us to do is one element of it is isolating a specific part of the stroke so you can really break things down um, other presenters here have talked about yeah, being able to do things in a slower, more controlled, more stable environment. The second element is it exposes a habit. I'll often use drill work, do something that's particularly challenging so that suddenly a rower is aware of, oh, I don't square the blade early enough, or I don't actually tap down at the release and that's why I hate rowing square blades. Or, wow, if I have to do cut the cake, I realize that I am not using my hips to get any sort of forward hinge at all. And then the one that is my favorite is using a drill to create a sensation. I was talking to some athletes earlier today about, you know, one of the challenges in our sport is we can't see what we're doing. We have to be able to feel most of what we're doing. And that sensation, sometimes when it feels right in our body, and yet a coach is sitting there saying you're doing the wrong thing, one of the ways that we as coaches can use drills is to give an athlete a different sensation and help them train towards recreating that sensation and defining it as their, their new correct thing. So looking at suspension, there's a couple key things um, that are sort of the primary elements that I target with this drill sequence. One, sequence is important. You cannot suspend on air, which means that if your blades are not in the water, you can't be suspended. So respecting the sequence that happens at the catch is number one in figuring out how to suspend. Last week, I told some athletes who are doing this drill that if any of them could successfully suspend with their blades in the air, I would give them $100 on the spot. And my bank account did not go down, but one of them definitely went swimming. Um, if you wanna go and test the validity of that statement on your own, by all means, I encourage you to do so in some warm water. The second element is suspension is created when you have equal, opposite, and simultaneous forces. In the shell, that's gonna be opposing forces between the hands and feet, and then forces on the port and starboard blades. If either set of those forces don't happen at the same time, something's going to shift in the wrong direction. The boat's not gonna go straight, it's gonna be unset, you're gonna shoot your slide, whatever it is. If those forces are not equal, the same thing's gonna happen. The boat's not gonna go straight, your set's gonna be all off, you're probably gonna end up hurting yourself and working really hard to not go very far or very fast. And the last element to understand here is that when it comes to suspension, being coordinated is more valuable than being powerful. We often use power in our strokes to overcome 
our uh, shortcomings and being able to be coordinated. Maintaining suspension throughout a piece down a race course or just throughout a number of continuous strokes, that maintenance requires fitness and that requires power. But just getting yourself suspended is more about coordinated muscle firing and timing of the bodies and the blades than it is about just pulling hard. Oh, and there's a couple quick questions before you go any further, just asking if you can give a quick definition of suspension. Suspension is your body weight coming off of the seat and being connected to the blades. And the video that I'll show here on the next slide, um, you'll get a very clear indication of that. Um, so I work suspension in a skill cycle. I do not do this drill in isolation. This is a fairly advanced drill. I actually use the um, rowing in place drill that Ellen started with as the first stop in this cycle. And you can do it in a, in a fun way where you do actually get to come off the seat and stay off the seat as long as possible. And I break up this cycle with bouts of continuous rowing. So one thing that I tried, I've, I've learned through um, many mistakes with this particular sequence is don't just do all the drills in sequence, block them in with some continuous rowing because so much of the sensation is based on experimentation. You have to let somebody, you have to let yourself, you have to let your athletes experiment with it to start finding a new feeling. So the block down here that says catch timing with suspension, that's the drill that I'm going to show here in just a moment. And it comes about halfway through the cycle. So this is a slap drill, catch placement, catch hang progression. You're gonna see this athlete do two reps of a slap drill, which is a stationary catch drill, but instead of squaring the blades, you let the flat blade slap on the water. This is the first indicator to an athlete of when the blade is actually getting into the water. If you hear the slap after you arrive at the catch, you can bet that you probably tend to miss some connection at the front end. Your legs are probably already moving. So as she goes, she's gonna slap the water and she's trying to hear that slap as she arrives at full slide. The second part of this is a traditional catch placement drill. So it's the same movement, but now you're gonna square and place the blade. So again, you're working that awareness of, is the blade actually going in the water as I arrive at the catch or is it happening later? The next element she's going to add on to this, and this is really where I really want to focus, is she's going to catch and then hang her body weight. And the goal in watching this is to see daylight between the seat and the athlete's hips. And ideally, she does this without the seat sliding back at all. Everything stays stationary and her weight comes straight up. So she's gonna get the blades in. I almost edited out that one because it was unset, but it's important to recognize that you can still suspend even when the boat is unset and that suspension will reestablish your stability. Okay, so if she were to be doing reps of this where you see her hips go back or her seat were to slide, without the handles coming with it, what it would say to me is that those equal forces between the feet and hands are off. So this is teaching the athlete to be coordinated with the timing of the blades locking into the water prior to trying to apply any pressure to it, as well as learning to be coordinated in squeezing the lats, squeezing the glutes, squeezing the hamstrings and quads to push. So getting the placement, Using the auditory cues of this is a great way to pay attention to whether or not you're able to do this continuously. If you can hear the blades go in, that's your cue that now you can fire some muscles and hopefully hang right off the blades. After this athlete did this set, we went and did about 3K of continuous rowing just at low rates. And what I told her was, I want you to try and start the drive on the edge of the front edge of your seat and suspend just enough that you're landing on the back edge of your seat. And then you sort of have to chim yourself back into place on the recovery. So we just scaled down how much she's suspending so that she's able to row continuously. Okay. 
And I'll go ahead and cut myself off there before I spend too long on my suspension soapbox. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, just as a, as a uh, cherry on that, I have a, I have a video of the natural end of that. Oh shoot, where is it? Sorry. Um, here we have an athlete suspending from a very unstable position. And I saw there was a, there was a question in the chat um, about how you avoid losing your seat. And the, the simple answer to that is when, when you suspend, you want to get most of your weight off the seat, but keep just enough on your seat to keep it under you. Um, okay, Erica, uh, questions for any or all of our panelists? Yeah, um, I have a couple. If anyone has more questions, they can keep sending them to me. Um, it's helpful if you just keep it to me privately so it doesn't clutter up the chat. But the first question, I'm gonna go in order, uh, was from Ellen's presentation. Kristen asked, Will, if, um, if I would ask you about the, what you said about the arms continuing to open after the back is set, she thought that arms should have been extended by the time the back is set. Of Ellen. Ellen, Ellen's muted. Um, go ahead, un unmute yourself, Ellen. There we go. Um, Kristen, th the, the arms are extended as your body is set, but as you approach the catch and your knees are, your shins are vertical and your body's rested uh, uh, on your thighs as much as you're going to, it's still possible for your arms to open out. The shoulders come open, they spread wide. And that's one thing that you can play with with the wide grip, because if your hands are farther out in the arc, you can get m more of, a, of, of an angle and an openness. And with somebody my size and most normal sizes, there's not a danger of of pinching the boat and getting the oars parallel to the um, boat, as Carol was suggesting some people can do. For me, there's a better connection if my hands are farther apart and I come in um, through the arc of the stroke than if my arms are straight out. So if you think of your hands following in an arc, you get as far as you can in your body position, but you can almost always spread your hands farther apart. And so that it's in the latter part of the recovery just before the entry. It's not in the body prep part of the stroke. Okay. Um, and then another question about that rowing in place drill, Ellen. Uh, John asked, someday we'll be back in big boats. How would you run that drill in a big boat? Uh, I have never rowed in a big boat, so I couldn't answer that question, but I can't imagine it would be any different. Everybody would still have to follow everybody else, and you could start doing it by twos or fours or sixes and then get everybody into it, but it's how the body's moving through the, through the sequence of the stroke, but maybe somebody who's a sweep rowing coach could talk about that a little more. Ellen, that's my, that's my go-to warm-up drill with all of my team boats. It works very well. It, it will very swiftly teach your four or your eight to do that drill uh, with restraint and patience and caution because the mass of the crew, if they get a little too eager, uh, can very easily sort of catapult people out of their seats and uh, potentially even into the water. But it, it can be done in a, in a team boat, as Helen notes. You can do it in, in, a, in a single one time when I was beginning to teach this. I said, just follow the path of the handles into the um, full compression. And one of the rowers 
just went right over the front end of the boat into the water. And she said, what did I do wrong? I said, you didn't do anything wrong. You did exactly what I said. You followed the handle. So we have to be careful with our words, I think. Um, so here's a, ch a question that came up during Jeannie's presentation. So if Jeannie can unmute herself next. Um, I guess it doesn't specifically pertain to Jeannie's presentation, but Terry asked, I need a drill to practice becoming more comfortable opening the arms wider and coming into the catch. So maybe El that's more of an Ellen question too, because I think that relates to what we've been talking about. Yeah, or Carol. Mm -hmm. Did you say that again? And that's what I'm trying to get across with a wide grip drill is I think the biggest limit, at least the biggest limitation for me was my shoulders are just so tight at the crossover that once you get there, it's hard to open up the shoulders after that. But if I could stay wider and open right at the crossover, then it's just like what Ellen was talking about, just extend the arms straight out to the sides. It's really about being um. um Troy, what was the name of the guy that we had a few years back? He was in the quad. He wasn't very tall at all, but he could get good length. It, ben Dan. Um, yeah. Ben Dan is maybe five foot nine. He does have uh, disproportionately long arms, but he had a phrase that, that goes right along with Ellen's drill and with your wide grip drill. And what, what Ben liked to say about the catch position uh, was that when, when he gets up to the front end, he wants to feel like he's hugging the horizon. And, you know, if, you, if you're tight and tense in the shoulders and chest, as, as Ellen and Carol are both talking about, and you're, you're, you're like this, well, this is not an inviting hug. So if you're going to hug the horizon, you have to let your shoulders relax and your chest open so that you can allow yourself to come out around the arcs. And uh, that's, that's one place where I think... Uh, doing a lot of erging, when you get back in the boat, you need to be very mindful of the idea that uh, th there are no arcs on the ergs. You have a straight handle and you're going straight forward and you are coming straight back with that handle. And when you get in a sculling boat, you, you need to, to follow the arcs, which both uh, Carol's drill and Ellen's drill, um, that they're, they're both very useful drills for learning, for learning exactly that skill. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's almost a, a boathouse truism that if, if, uh, if you are a short and or short limbed person, it is, it is difficult to row a super long sweep stroke because your hands are, are fixed on a handle and the handle follows one arc and the length of your arms is the length of your arms. You may get, you may get some additional length from, from flexibility in your hips and being able to, to rotate around or rotate your, your rib cage and your spine. Um, but ultimately the length of your arms is the length of your arms. But sometimes you see uh, fairly short people who row really long sculling strokes because they've, they've learned to relax their shoulders and chest and get out there to that position around the arcs and to hug the horizon. And sometimes you see tall, long-limbed people who row short sculling strokes at the front end because they, they are sort of up here and they're tight in their shoulders and chest and they're they're sort of erging the boat. They're thinking, okay, I have to bring my handles forward. And what you really, what you really are aiming for is uh, coming out and around. You're, you're working with two arcs rather than one straight handle. So yeah, th thank you, Carol, for reminding me of, of Ben and the, the Hug the Horizon phenomenon. Yeah. Um, and there's two questions that are kind of related to this topic um, that relate to how it affects rigging and your inboard length. So they're wondering if those factors affect the rower's ability to push their hands apart instead of forward and to keep the shoulder and chest open. That's why I row with a much shorter inboard than some people do because my arms are short and if I had a more standard inboard I wouldn't be able to get my hands much beyond straight. So a shorter inboard lets me get more of the arc working for me. Shorter inboard also means less leverage. So my strength has to come from somewhere, but playing with the rigging can help with 
on some of that stuff. Okay. Um, a general question here that I think anybody could answer. Um, and Jane asked how or when you would suggest doing drills in your rowing session and how often. So just how to build those into a, to a practice. Well, I've always thought that most masters, and I think that's everybody in this chat, you know, we either have some place to go to, we have a job to get to, or this or that, and all we want to do is the work, the hard work, we want to get exercise. I think you should pick one or two drills, maybe a different one or two each day and rotate through them, but make yourself do either a certain distance or a certain amount of time that you're giving yourself permission to work on the skill, not just on the physiological workout that you might get. And I think that's the beauty of Craftsbury is that you're giving yourself permission to work on the skills. So I think everybody, I mean, you should have a, a, a standard list that you like to go through and, and sort of make yourself do it to start with, but it's a great way to sort of wake up and to be focused your mind into what you're doing in the boat. Yeah, I, I would just add on to that saying, um, I block my sessions. So we do two rounds, three if it's a longer practice of the same sort of 10 or so minutes of drill work, 20 to 25 minutes of steady state. And we'll repeat that exact same block. So there's a return to the same drill, but it's able to be broken up. So if, if you have a shorter session, just shorten the length of those blocks. But I usually do about twice as much time on steady state as on drill work and try and repeat that at least for two rotations. Another way is you can, and I, when I was rowing for Bob Ernst, uh, who was a coach at University of Washington for a number of years, we would do maybe an hour's worth of steady state, but there was always a drill thrown in there. Um, and you could pretty much expect when it was gonna come in. And he wasn't, he didn't come up with a lot of different drills. He just, the way he put it, you don't wanna jump through too many hoops. So the drills were always very basic, you know, pretty much the drills that we talked about today. Um, and if you're doing long steady state, you could break it up by throwing a drill in every thousand meters or every five minutes or something like that. Cause you're not gonna lose the heart rate if the drill is a moving drill. Um, and also you can just build it into your warm up. But I think it, you, know, you, can, you can throw in a high power 10 and in a way, that's a drill, or throw in a start, a flying start. And in a way, that's a drill also, but you need to have an intention about it. But definitely, you can break up long steady state, not lose anything, and still get the, 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 best, the best part is it gives you an awareness of what you're doing. And if you're not rowing as part of the team, and if you don't have coaches with you on the water all the time, you can turn the drill work into sort of playing and row for a while and then take a break and um, concentrate on some particular aspect. Um, and you can, you can learn things when you're not even thinking that you're learning something. I had a broken ax, uh, seat um, with where the wheels were kind of crooked and it was making an incredibly awful noise and as I was rowing along I paid attention to it and I noticed the noise was only on the recovery so that let me know I was practicing suspension so I made um, <laughs> a very conscious effort to make sure I was suspending on each stroke so I didn't have I only had the noise half the time <laughs> instead of the whole time so you can learn things um, in very interesting ways with rowing. And being playful is an advantage that some of us have, especially now rowing in singles and not having to race. We can just mess around. And drills can be a informed messing around. So I had a couple quick follow-up questions that came up uh, when you guys were talking about 
shortening inboard. Um, but I think we're that's getting into the weeds about rigging. So I would suggest to those people they can um, email us or email me afterwards, and then maybe we can follow up on those. The questions I have so far are about um, drills that we haven't addressed yet. So maybe I'll throw some out and see if any of you guys like those drills or want to comment on those drills. Um, one was specifically for Troy asking about the Burke Belden drill, which came up last week during Rick's presentation, I believe. I should have reviewed that, but I admit that I am unprepared to talk about the Burke Belden drill because without seeing the video of it, I don't think I could even describe it. So I'm, I'm sorry to, to not be able to answer that question today. Do you want me to describe it and then you can answer or do we want to move on? What, uh, if, yeah, Ellen, t go for it. It was a favorite one where you begin the stroke more with the arms and then push with your legs. It was uh, um, Wes was the subject in right. the exercise and it was supposed to um, show how Joe Burke rode by bending his arms much earlier in the stroke than most of us do. And I forget the Belden part, um, <laughs> but it was to let you feel um, the, the different ways of engaging and getting connected, I think. Oh, sure. And that's, that's one of Rick's favorites. Um, yes. And I, I, I wish Rick were here to tell us um, how and why he uses it. But the, the first place my mind goes with that is that the, the, the idea of drills as feeling something different, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm still not quite prepared to address the Burke Belden drill specifically, but in the spirit of in the spirit of doing a drill for the purpose of feeling something different than the way that you habitually row and to get you out of your habitual movement patterns, uh, which everyone tends to fall into if we are not specifically working on something. Uh, we, we had um, the U23 athletes out uh, last week and we asked them to spend a short period deliberately uh, deliberately sculling as though the first half of the drive was the most important part of the drive and to really get on it at, in, in the top part of the drive, the first half of the drive, and then to deliberately shift and flip that on its head such that they emphasized the second half of the drive. And so we, we, called, the, we called the first rhythm the, the hit it and quit it, which is kind of a, a very common uh, drive rhythm for a lot of people we we know that our hips and our legs are are that's that's where our strongest muscles are so we we put a lot of effort into the first half of the drive and because the boat has momentum the second half of the drive happens but a lot of times people go a little bit passive and when you contrast that by having someone be more patient on the first half of the drive and then really begin to try to feel the acceleration of the handles in the second half of the drive uh, you get what we were calling last week a suspend and send rhythm and just doing 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 two very different things in order to feel two very different uh, stroke rhythms it, it gets you out of a out of a habitual pattern and um, that's if I were going to employ the Burke Belden drill that would be the reason that I would employ it but I can't speak for Rick, so I'm, I'm going to have to bone up on the Burke Belden drill and reasons to do it in order to be able to answer that question should it ever come up again. Rick has raised his hand. Should we let him is, take, is a, take it on? Or? It looks like it. Okay, let's, if Rick's here, give him the floor. Okay. All right. Rick, I asked you to unmute. Hi, Erica. Hello, Rick. Hey, Troy. Uh, uh, on that Burke Belden drill, Troy, what you just said about the uh, suspend and send, that Burke Belden drill is, is specifically designed to encourage that. Um, the idea being is that the way I've described it when we talked to Steve back in the fall with Wes was that the most power in the stroke was just before the blade released the water. So that was that, was that, that exercise, the Burke Belden exercise, which I came up with the name of that, 
was designed to try to encourage a peak power just before the release. So what you said and what you were doing last week would be sort of a, a way of getting more comfortable with that, that, that exercise. That makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and oh. thank you, Rick. I, I didn't know you were in the audience, but uh, lucky, lucky for us. Uh, and the, what, what you were just saying uh, reminds me that the Burke Belden drill, uh, to my mind, it explodes the myth that you absolutely must hang with long arms. And I, I've had more than one coach tell me that uh, breaking the arms uh, too early is, is a cardinal sin. And listening to you over the past 12 years and watching uh, scholars like Vacheslav Ivanov and Mirka Napkova, Mir Mirka Napkova won the Olympics and she breaks her arms early. So, you know, go, go ahead and tell me that you absolutely <laughs> must hang with straight arms. And oh, what, what, would, what would Mirka Napkova have done if she, how much faster could she have been if she just kept her arms long? Well, I'm not sure she would have been faster. She might have been slower. Uh, I'm not saying it's a, it's a good thing to immediately try to bring the handles back to you, but a, a little bend in the arm as, as in the Burke Belden drill, not a cardinal sin at all. We can make a boat go very fast with, uh, with that idea of, of suspend and send, and there's more than one way to, to get the suspension and the send as well. Thanks, Rick. You're welcome. I will, someone asked for a link to the video, which we shared as part of last week's presentation. So if you guys just give me a moment, I can share that in the chat. Um, while I'm looking for that, uh, someone asked if you guys could talk more about the pick drill. It's a pretty standard drill. I think a lot of people do it. Maybe they want to know more about the reasoning behind it. I actually don't, don't do it. And I, don't like it because it starts with the hands only. I'd rather do a reverse pick if I'm going to do it because that's where we're trying to move the boat. And there's almost never a time when I'm just using my arms. So I don't actually like it. I'm, I'm with Jeannie on this one. I actually think that rowing arms only, particularly in the single, is probably the most challenging thing to do correctly and one of the easiest things to do wildly and correctly. And it trains. <laughs> a habit of, of being way over engaged in the traps and being too tight to the wrists. So um, if, if I use it, it's generally for people who maybe just aren't at the comfort level of being able to get up to the front end and they just need to move with the boat a little bit. But I, I otherwise generally tend to go with the reverse pick drill. I think if you do it slowly and gently, it can let you know, um, how your hands are working, if you can square and feather the, the blades. And it can also let you feel what your arms can do at that part of the stroke to still be holding on to the water and sus suspending the boats. You don't do it by just bringing your hands to your torso, but you do it by drawing your elbows back. Then when you add in the body swing, it's adding in so you first do the body swing and then you continue what you've discovered you can do with just the arms at the end and the same way it just builds up the stroke um, but you have to do it uh, at a relatively slow stroke rate especially the arms only part and if you line up a bunch of singles side by side and have people do it it's very interesting to see who has the the smooth power right at that final part of the stroke it just adds it all up together for me and i would agree you know i think so long as you're really paying attention and making sure you're sitting correctly um the pick at the release is okay. I started having my team do um, about the pick length, but starting from the middle and then working out, you know, adding length to both the release and the catch. So you really, and what that does is it helps you stay up on your sit bones better. I think one of the hardest things to do in a single is to sit properly because your legs are straight out in front of you. Um, one of the things I have people do a lot of times is just take their feet, this is when it's warmer, um, take their feet out of their shoes and just put them in the water on either side and that puts your tailbone in a good spot 
and when you're just starting to warm up, you don't want to start out with a really long stroke. And I, with the reverse pick, I find it a little bit hard on the back if I'm not warmed up yet. So I like starting right in the middle and then working out towards the end. But again, it's the same idea of you know, place, release, place, release, making it short um, and also just working your muscles, warming them up until you get longer again, striding out. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying this discussion of, of the pick drill because I think uh, it's, it's probably if, if if pause drills are not the most ubiquitous drills in rowing and sculling, then the pick drill is the most ubiquitous uh, drill in rowing and sculling. And I, I think that this, uh, this discussion reveals that every drill has, has a usefulness and every drill has, has a potential downside. And I, I agree with Carol that uh, one, one, of the, one of the compelling reasons to do the pick drill is to sort of establish that firm platform at the release so that you've got something firm to, to finish the stroke with. Uh, and I agree with, with Ellen and Jeannie as well. And I think that one, one, of the, one of the big drawbacks to the pick drill um, can be that it, it tends to encourage, especially the, the steps where it's arms only and arms and back, uh, it tends to encourage rowing it in or hammering the catch. So, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you know why you're doing the drill and what you're hoping to get out of it, the pick drill can be useful as any other drill can be useful. And if, you, uh, if you're doing it because the coach said to do it or, or uh, we always do this drill, then uh, we, we fall into the same trap that we began this presentation with the, the idea that um, uh, you shouldn't do anything mindlessly. All right. Um, looks like we're... Uh, well, we're, we're right on time, and um, we want to thank everybody for coming to our fourth webinar. Uh, we will have another one next Wednesday and another one the Wednesday after that. We've got three more scheduled. Um, next week is about uh, rhythm and other sources of free speed. Uh, the following week, we're going to have Marlene Royal on, and the week after that, we're going to have strength coach Will and details of all of those uh, webinars will be forthcoming on our website. So thanks for coming, everyone. We don't have any outro music, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll try to end this as graciously as possible. Um, it's been a, been a fun hour and 15 minutes. And um, thank you, Ellen, Carol, Jeannie, and Helen. And we will see everybody next time. Thanks much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Continue off. Oh, and Rick, thank you, Rick. <laughs>